in 1998 off Canada's east coast. A modern passenger jet run by one of the world's best airlines catches fire at 33,000 feet. In its final six minutes, communications from the cockpit cease. It's burning already! Then the plane plummets into the ocean. Two hundred and twenty-nine people are dead. What caused the fire is a mystery. Many of the vessels uh, reported to the Canadian Navy vessel standing by on scene that they were finding bodies and making repeated requests uh, for more body bags and get the bodies. That were now, terrible. after one of the largest investigations in aviation history, the complete story behind the loss of Swiss Air Flight 111 can finally be told. It's a wake-up call for the entire airline industry to ensure that what happened aboard Swiss Air 111 would never happen again. This accident investigation was a unique opportunity to assess the materials in airplanes. And the problem is not only just the stuff that can burn, but the fact you can't see it. When you really have fire on board, the clock is running against you. September the 2nd, 1998. Swiss Air Flight 111 prepared to depart New York's JFK International Airport en route to Geneva, Switzerland. The aircraft was a McDonnell Douglas 11, or MD-11, a model first developed in 1986 as a highly automated, modern replacement for the antiquated DC-10. It was considered one of the most reliable passenger jets in the skies, and Swiss Air pilots were among the world's best trained. Okay, after start checklist. Um, engine anti-ice. Not required. Roger, not required. Auto brakes. Take off. Swiss Air 111's pilots were Captain Urs Zimmermann and First Officer Stefan Love. Swiss Air 111, hold short, 31 left. Zimmerman encouraged an easygoing atmosphere in the cockpit, but he was also known for his by the book precision. When not flying, he was an instructor of new pilots for Switzerland's national airline. Take off checklist. Uh, flaps and slats. Flaps set, 15 degrees. Set at 15. On board were 215 passengers, 12 crew, and two pilots. Most were French, American, or Swiss. 23-year-old Stephanie Shaw was on her way home to her parents in Geneva. Stephanie uh, was blessed in many ways. She was uh, physically very attractive. She was an intelligent girl. She, uh, the reason she went to New York was that she had been invited to become a member of the World Economic Forum, which is based in Geneva. And she wanted to have this trip uh, before she joined. She was a darling, she, an absolute darling. 8.18 p.m. Swiss Air 111 Hemi, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff. Roger, Swiss Air 111. For safety, the Swiss Air pilots push the throttles forward together, ensuring no single pilot can botch a takeoff. The R, the E2. Swiss Air Flight 111 lifted off and made her way northeast toward the open Atlantic. For the first 15 minutes after takeoff, there was no communication from Swiss Air 111. It was an unusual, small detail that would later baffle investigators. Well, it does happen occasionally. They had not yet reached what we call the North Atlantic track system, where then you're not really usually in radio contact. So 
I thought it was a little abnormal, but it appears it was just nothing more than a mistaken radio frequency. When the guy dialed it in and swapped over the radio, he had put in the incorrect frequency and evidently uh, just, you know, they didn't make another attempt at contacting someone. It was strange. And uh, I agree with you. It was kind of, it's kind of like, whoa, that's, that's interesting. Atlantic air traffic is handled by a remote center in Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. Almost half an hour after takeoff, Captain Zimmerman made his first communication with Moncton. Moncton Center, Swiss Air 111 Heavy, good uh, evening, level 330. Swiss Air 111 Heavy, Moncton Center, good evening. Reports of uh, occasional light turbulence at all levels. Moncton, Swiss Air. It was a perfectly normal transatlantic crossing. In first class, Swiss Air passengers were among the first in the world to have a personalized in-flight entertainment network. Though now common, the system was an innovation in 1998. Passengers could choose their own movie, browse the internet, and gamble. They uh, evaluated the market and they thought that introducing a modern in-flight entertainment system combined with a gambling system so that passenger actually can use their credit card and gamble during long-range flights um, would make them more attractive. This luxury would be the source of controversy to come. Smell something? Yeah, what is that? Go have a look, I'll take the controls. Roger, you have control. Are you the captain emergency, sir? Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Bailey now. First Officer Love investigated the area near the air conditioner vent. Harmless smoke traces from air conditioning systems are common on commercial jets. I don't see anything, Urs. And there's nothing up there now. You heal for me, Captain? Stefan and I were sure we smelled smoke a few seconds ago. Can you smell anything? I smell it too, yeah. Could you smell in the cabin before you came in? No, definitely not. They agreed that the air conditioner was the likely culprit. Can't see it or smell it anymore. Air conditioning, is it? Yeah. Please close it, thanks. Behind the sealed panel, the pilots could not see that the problem was getting worse. Less than 45 seconds after smoke disappeared in the cockpit of Swiss Air 111, it returned. Zimmerman followed Swiss Air procedure. There it is again. He made plans to divert to the nearest okay, place to land. Sound. Find the closest place to land, Stefan. We'll need the nav charts from the library, uh, also weather data for the area. Boston's close. Not doing well at all up there. Zimmerman radioed air traffic control in Moncton, New Brunswick. Moncton Center, Swiss Air 111 Heavy, good evening. United 920 Heavy, Moncton Center, good evening. The controller dealt with another aircraft before responding to Swiss Air. Other aircraft calling, say again. 
Swiss Air 111 Heavy is declaring pan, pan, pan. We have smoke in the cockpit. Uh, request um, uh, immediate return to a convenient place, I guess. Boston. Pan, pan, pan is an international term used to notify air traffic control of an urgent situation. One step below declaring Mayday. You say to Boston you want to go? Uh, I guess Boston. Uh, we need for some weather there. Uh, we are starting right turn here, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. Swiss Air 111, roger, and... Descent to flight level 310. 310. 310, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. This is the first interview with one of the air traffic controllers in Moncton. My name is Bill Pickerel, and on September 1998, September 2nd, 1998, I was one of two Halifax terminal controllers uh, working the evening shift. The pan uh, in any kind of a special uh, condition is usually dealt with uh, as an emergency, and this, in fact, was dealt with that way. The aircraft was immediately given priority and the uh, high-level supervisor initiated a call to the Rescue Coordination Center. Pickerel's colleague determined that Swiss Air 111 was just 66 nautical miles from Halifax and 300 from Boston. But Captain Zimmerman had chosen an airport he knew. A lot of times when you're having a problem, you would rather be dealing with an issue where you're much more familiar with the airport because that relieves a little stress on you. This is initial problem. He's sitting there, he's looking up there, and he's trying to think, well, I've got smoke here. Now, what does it mean? Let's see, where, where are we? Where's the closest place I can go to that I can talk to a Swiss air mechanic? Boston. Swiss Air 111 Center. Swiss Air 111 Heavy, go ahead. Would you prefer to go into Halifax? First, we better put the mask on. Uh, stand by. Realizing their location, Zimmerman decided Halifax was now the best option. Affirmative, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. We prefer Halifax from our position. Swiss Air 111 Roger, proceed direct to Halifax. Descend now to flight level 290. Level 290 to Halifax, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. A British Airways pilot in the area offered the crew what little help he could. Swiss Air 111 Heavy from Speedbird 214. I can give you the Halifax weather if you like. Swiss Air 111 Heavy, uh, we have the uh, oxygen masks on. Uh, go ahead with the weather. It's the 300 Zulu weather. Swiss Air 111 commenced its descent to below 30,000 feet. The pilots calm and in control. It would take about 20 minutes to reach Halifax. Roger, Swiss Air 111 Heavy, we copy 2980. Swiss Air 111, you're cleared to 10,000 feet, and the Halifax altimeter is 2980. Swiss Air 111 Heavy, 2980 at 10,000 feet. And Swiss Air 111, can you tell me what your fuel on board is? Uh, stand by for this. Speedbird 1506 is a Tusky listing out. Speedbird 1506, roger. The controller signed off with another aircraft. His jurisdiction was high altitude flights. As Swiss Air was on descent to Halifax, he hands over responsibility to Bill Pickrell. At that point, uh, everything was normal. Uh, I, I gave the pilot an initial descent, and uh, he requested to level off at an intermediate altitude to get the cabin in order for the landing, which I took to mean that they needed to pack away dinner trays and uh, things like that. It was an indication to me that uh, uh, while his situation was unusual, uh, that uh, they weren't considering it as uh, an emergency at that time. Watch your speed, Stefan. Don't descend too fast. Roger. Here, have the uh, cabin crew prepare for landing. We'll be setting down in Halifax in about 20 minutes. I'm about to start the checklist here. Yes, Captain Zimmerman. Zimmerman had two checklists for smoke in the cockpit. To complete both would take 20 minutes. This was Swiss Air Company policy. In the meantime, 
Love continued the descent into Halifax. Stefan, I'll need you to handle the radio while I do this checklist. All right. One one nine or point two for the Swiss Air one 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 heavy. Roger. Swiss Air 111 was now at about 25,000 feet. Pickerel advises them to descend to 3,000. But First Officer Love said he'd rather fly at 8,000 until the passenger cabin was cleared. Their attitude underscored the sense of control in the cockpit. From my point of view, it uh, gave all initial appearances that it should be a fairly straightforward operation, that uh, assuming that uh, everything happened normally, the aircraft uh, would require a minimum of handling to uh, uh, lead them into Halifax. Swiss Air 111, you can uh, descend to three, level off at an intermediate altitude if you wish, just advise. But Pickerel was concerned the plane was not coming down fast enough. It appeared that the aircraft uh, might have been a little bit high, and uh, I wanted to ensure that the pilots were aware of how uh, far they were from the airport, how many miles they had to fly, so that they could uh, judge their own descent and make their decision about what they wanted to do. Roger, at the time we descend to 8,000 feet, and we are clear at any time to 3,000 feet. I keep you advised. Okay, can I vector you uh, to set up for runway 06 at Halifax? Uh, Roger, a vector for six will be fine. Swiss Air 111, heavy. Swiss Air 111, Roger, turn left, heading of uh, 030. Left, heading 030 for the Swiss Air 111, heavy. Captain Zimmerman needed information for the unfamiliar airfield but his flight bag was out of reach. He summoned the flight attendant to help. You held me, Captain. For two minutes now. I need that flight bag there. It's got the approach charts for Halifax. <clears throat> we'll take it back to your crew. Yes, Captain. This is your major to cabin speaking. The chief flight attendant notified passengers that the flight was being diverted. There was no panic. The plane was flying normally, and there was no sign of smoke in the cabin. Swiss Air 111, the localizer frequency is 109 or decimal niner. You've got 30 miles to fly to the threshold. Uh, we're going to need more than 30 miles. But still at more than 20,000 feet, Swiss Air 111 was too high to make a landing in just 30 miles. The frequency is a 109er decimal niner for the localizer. OK, Roger, 109er point niner. And uh, we are turning left, heading uh, north, Swiss Air 111 heavy. And we've got to dump fuel. Agreed. So far, communications from Swiss Air had been calm. Still, Moncton Center initiated emergency efforts at Halifax Airport. Preparing ground crews for an emergency, Pickerel sought information from the pilots. souls on board and your fuel on board, please, for emergency services. Roger. At this time, fuel on board is two, three, zero tons. We have to dump some fuel. May we do that in this area during descent? Pickerel was surprised to learn so late that Swiss Air 111 needed to dump fuel. At that point, it became more of a complicated situation. In fact, with every transmission after that, it became more and more complicated. Pickerel considered his options for a safe place that wouldn't take the aircraft too far from Halifax. He decided to direct the plane over St. Margaret's Bay, about 30 miles from the airport. The other choice, uh, if he had said he needed to stay close, was to uh, start the aircraft in a, a, a right-hand turn to uh, set him up for any of the other runways. I had to keep him flying in a, in a circle or a constant track so that 
he wouldn't fly back into his own fuel, which would have been uh, not good. Dumping fuel is standard procedure. A fully fueled passenger jet is too heavy and could break up on landing. Are you able to take but co-pilot Love wondered if, given their situation, they might uh, forgo the short, regulations. They want us to turn to the south. Should we just forget about dumping and just land? No, dump it. Okay, we are able for a left or right turn to the south in order to dump. I initiated the vector back toward St. Margaret's Bay to start him in that direction. It indicated to me that, again, uh, it wasn't uh, a critical situation on board, that in fact he did have time to be able to go back and uh, dump his fuel over the water. Swiss Air 111, uh, roger. Turn left, heading of uh, 200 degrees, and advise me when you're ready to dump. It will be about 10 miles before you're off the coast. You will still be within about 25 miles of the airport. Roger, we are turning left, 200. In that case, we are going to descend to only 10,000 feet in order to dump the fuel. Roger, maintain 10,000. I'll advise you when you're over the water. It will be very shortly. Roger. While Zimmerman continued with his checklist, Love accidentally transmitted to Bill Pickrell in Moncton. Are you in the emergency checklist for air conditioning smoke? Yes. Uh, Swiss Air 111, say again, please. Uh, sorry, that was not for you. Swiss Air 111 was asking internally. OK. Airspeed is decreasing below 306. Level off speed here. Let's fly the plane as you see fit, Stefan. Swiss Air 111, continue left heading 180. You'll be off the coast in about 15 miles. Left heading 180, roger. Swiss Air 111 and maintaining at 10,000 feet. Roger. Cabin bus off. Cabin bus off, roger. The cabin bus switch knocked out all the lighting in the cabin. It was an indication for the passengers that something was wrong, but hardly alarming. Ladies and gentlemen, we have temporarily lost the lights in the cabin. Please remain calm. The crew will be coming around with flashlights to assist in landing. Despite a cockpit filled with smoke, there was still no trace in the passenger cabin. <laughs> you will be staying within about uh, 35, 40 miles of the airport if you have to get back to the airport in a hurry. OK, that's fine with us. Please tell us when we can start to dump the fuel. Suddenly, the aircraft sent out a warning that the smoke was a sign of a more serious problem. Autopilot disconnect. Copy that. Autopilot disconnect. Swiss Air 111. The autopilot disconnected because the plane's computers sensed erratic readings. In the next 90 seconds, those readings went haywire. 11,000 and 9,000 feet. Swiss Air 111, you can block between 5,000 and 12,000 if you wish. One by one, the instruments failed. The calm in the cockpit dissolved. Copy that. We are clear between 12 and 5,000 feet. We are declaring emergency now. Swiss Air 111 at time 0124. Then the two pilots spoke simultaneously. Combined with other distractions in the control room, Pickerel was unable to hear a critical transmission. Love's declaration that they must land immediately. We are dumping fuel now. We must land immediate. Swiss Air 111, just a couple more miles. I'll be right with you. Roger that. And we are declaring emergency now. Swiss Air 111. Missing this transmission is a moment Bill Pickerel relives today. I'm not sure that it's a feeling that you can adequately describe. I recall reviewing the events of that night a thousand times to determine if there was something additionally that I could have done or if there was uh, some mistake that I might have made or was there any way that I contributed to this. And eventually I was able to come to the point of realization that there wasn't anything that I could have done. Uh, that Everything that could have was done. Now there was nothing to do but wait. Thirty seconds after declaring an emergency, the pilots of Swiss Air 111 faced an inferno. All 
my screens are down. I'm flying on standby instruments, maintaining 300. Swiss Air 111, you are cleared to commence your fuel dump on that track and advise me when your dump is complete. Soon after I gave him authorization to commence the fuel dump, um, there was no acknowledgement. Um, initially, I wasn't concerned by that because I considered that he was probably doing the fuel dump, he was reviewing a checklist, he was busy doing things, and as per our training, we're told not to bother the pilots in those kinds of situations. Swiss Air 111, check. You are cleared to start the fuel dump. no further communication from the aircraft. Six minutes later, residents of Peggy's Cove heard a devastating explosion. No one knew what had happened to 229 people after six minutes of silence. It was probably one of the most helpless feelings that any individual can have, not being able to do anything but just sit and watch the target and hope that it would turn back toward the airport. And of course it didn't. The following morning, would-be rescuers glimpsed the terrible remains of Swiss Air 111. Only one body was discovered intact. In Geneva, Ian Shaw had a premonition about his 23-year-old daughter, Stephanie. That night, the night on which she was due to return, for reasons I can't explain even now, I was restless and I was disturbed, and um, I uh, slept early and woke uh, while my wife was still awake and asked her if she had had news of Stephanie. No, she had not, but she didn't expect to have news of Stephanie. We knew she was coming on that flight and that she would certainly expect me to be at the airport to fetch her in the morning. I awoke uh, around 6 Geneva time and on television there was a report of the crash of Swiss Air 111. And I knew instantaneously that we had lost our daughter. Air traffic controller Bill Pickrell was in shock. It's a strange experience. Um, I'm not sure that I can adequately express the feelings, but it's... Um, you work to, to provide a service and you, uh, you read about aircraft flying into a mountain or ending up in a swamp in some distant country, but you never expect that it's going to happen in your backyard. And when it does, it's... Uh, Kind of a lonely experience, I guess, in one sense. The Transportation Safety Board of Canada launched what would become the largest disaster investigation in the nation's history. They only knew Swiss Air 111 experienced a cockpit fire, but what caused it remained a mystery. Well, this accident was a challenging one to investigate in that initially, of course, we had to recover the aircraft from about 55 meters of water, around 185 feet. Of course, it was also in many pieces. As it turns out, it was in a couple of million pieces. 
So that was the initial challenge. And then after that, of course, uh, when you have so many pieces, you need to de determine which are the relevant ones and what are these pieces telling you about what happened and why. The TSB embarked on a five-stage plan. First, divers were deployed to survey the wreckage. They discovered that the plane was smashed into millions of pieces. But as the autumn weather worsened, the risks to divers increased. At this rate, the salvage would take years to complete. Stage two. With help from the United States Navy, remote operated vehicles began a more detailed search. The ROVs helped investigators survey the site. But the question remained, how to recover tiny pieces of twisted metal from the bottom of the sea? We have to go through little bits of airplanes, little pieces. In Swiss Air, we've had about two million pieces of airplane, and we pretty much almost had to look at them all because we had to discredit certain things, terrorists, uh, bombs, various other types of faults. The TSB's investigators finally got the breakthrough they'd been seeking, the black boxes. Recordings of cockpit and computer data told investigators that everything on the plane was working perfectly until the last few minutes. When the crew declared the pan, 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 that they had smoke in the cockpit, after going through all of these parameters, uh, we found no anomalies or no problems in any of that flight data that suggested there was a problem with the aircraft. So this led us to believe that the crew had a relatively operational aircraft. Aside from the, the smoke in the cockpit that they noted, uh, everything else appeared to be working fine. And uh, as they were making their plan to uh, descend the aircraft, they experienced a series of systems failures that were in rapid succession and exponential. Copy that, autopilot disconnect. Swiss Air 111, we must fly manually now. Mike Poole's CVR team then faced a serious setback. The last six minutes on both flight recorders were missing. You're losing systems rapidly on the airplane in that 90-second period that things are happening very fast. And the last thing we, one of the last things we know about was the two recorders went offline. So the fire has uh, presumably breached the lines, breached the, uh, breached the sources to these recorders and has stopped them. With the failure of the black boxes, investigators were no closer to learning how or where the fire started on Swiss Air 111. Stage three, barges were deployed to scour the seabed for evidence. One by one, sad remnants of the airplane reached the surface. Her engines were recovered. Then the landing gear. These were among the largest pieces of Swiss Air 111 to be recovered. The rest were mere fragments, dredged up in a painfully slow process. Stage four, a nearby military hangar provided a makeshift lab for the growing team of forensic investigators. Representatives from the American NTSB, Boeing, Swiss Air, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police joined in the search for answers. Pieces of Swiss Air 111 arrived by the truckload, organized into various categories for analysis. Soon the hangar was stacked to capacity with the biggest jigsaw puzzle in aviation history. All the investigators knew for sure was that an initially small cockpit fire suddenly turned to catastrophe. The team sorted through nearly 155 miles of wiring retrieved from the wreckage of Swiss Air 111. Here, the first real clue, evidence of electrical arcing. 
scorch marks on metal reveal that the source of the fire was in the back of the cockpit, directly behind the first officer. By examining the aircraft's wiring plans, investigators found a likely suspect, the entertainment system in first class. The system had some major deficiencies. It was getting very hot. It drew a lot of power. And uh, thereby, for example, raising the cabin, uh, cabin temperature uh, considerably, because it was always running. They did not install a simple off switch, nor did they install appropriate cooling systems to cool the system down. The TSB's investigators finally thought they had the breakthrough they'd been seeking. Our report indicates that there was a design flaw in the way the in-flight entertainment network installed in the first class and business class uh, sections of the aircraft were installed, uh, integrated into the electrical system of the airplane. When Captain Zimmerman threw the cabin bus switch, all power to the cabin should have been switched off. But the entertainment system remained on, overheating. If you had asked most pilots, they would say, well, if I push the cabin butt switch, it's going to turn off the things behind the cockpit. It's going to isolate that electrically for me so that I don't have to worry about that and that I can just concentrate on those things that might affect me flying the airplane. Well, as it turns out, that this switch was kind of bypassed in, in this case for this IFN or, or entertainment system. Swiss Air immediately disabled the entertainment systems on the rest of its fleet and the US National Transportation Safety Board ordered an inspection of cockpit wiring on all MD-11s. Unfortunately, this simple solution proved insufficient. By the time that cabin switch was turned off, the fire was well underway, and uh, so that had no real um, bearing on the, the initiation or propagation of the fire in the Swiss Air 111 aircraft. But investigators determined that the problem with the entertainment system alone could not have brought down Swiss Air 111. The search for answers continued. Stage five. Undaunted, the TSB reconstructed the MD-11 from the wreckage. A wireframe mock-up they called the jig provided a spine for placing tiny pieces back where they once belonged. The reconstruction revealed that the fire spread with alarming speed from the cockpit back into the first-class galleys. Some metal showed heat damage from temperatures as high as 600 degrees centigrade. As the investigation continued, some argued that the actions of the pilots may have contributed to the disaster. Some experts charged that Zimmerman and Love's by the book approach may have cost them their lives. Was asking internally. Some operators emphasized in a very early stage, land as soon as possible, and then if you have time, go into the checklist. Others uh, said, here's the checklist, and at the end of the checklist, if that doesn't help, then land as soon as possible. Pretty contradictory to basic flying instructions where Student pilots uh, learn at a very early stage that whenever you have smoke, you have a fire, and fire means land as soon as possible. Emergency light switch on. Emergency light switch on. Unfortunately, in this case, the way the checklist was written, it didn't identify that now start towards the divert. It started more on, let's try to see if we can solve the problem. And. Uh, so now, all of a sudden, you're taking on a problem that just kind of crept up on you. You weren't expecting it. Uh, we're going to need more than 30 miles. But the TSB considered the timeline. Investigators determined that Swiss Air 111 would not have made Halifax Airport under any circumstances. There just wasn't enough time. In our calculation, uh, we uh, showed that starting at the ideal descent point from 33,000 feet, uh, which was uh, at about uh, 10, 14 p.m. that night. 
it would take some 13 minutes to get the airplane onto the ground, which would take us to 10.27 p.m. By 10.24, the systems in the aircraft were starting to deteriorate. So we believe that under these circumstances, uh, the crew would not have been able to successfully land the airplane under those conditions with the amount of time that they had. Whatever caused the fire on Swiss Air, it happened at a lethal speed. The mystery remained. A year passed, then another ambitious operation began. The TSB hired a sophisticated Dutch salvage ship, Queen of the Netherlands. The vessel has a gigantic vacuum system, capable of dredging even the tiniest pieces of Swiss Air 111 from the ocean floor. A mixture of seawater, silt and aircraft were pumped into the ship's hold. This cargo was then pumped into a specially constructed reservoir on shore. When the water drained away, investigators found another million pieces of the aircraft. Any one of them may have held the clue to what caused the catastrophic fire. The painstaking sorting once again resumed. Finally, after 15 months, they found what they'd been seeking, a single faulty wire. We looked at all of the possible sources of uh, heat that might start a fire in that area. And in this instance, um, we did uh, discover a wire that uh, arced in that way. And right next to it was some very flammable material called uh, metallized polyethylene terephthalate covering material that uh, covers the insulation blankets. This polyethylene insulate, which lined the MD-11, is common on commercial airlines worldwide. It has passed the industry's flammability tests that require materials to self-extinguish after a reasonable period of time. The investigation now took an abrupt turn. Instead of seeking the cause of the fire, the TSB now focused on the flammable materials that fueled it. This thermal acoustical material that was in this aircraft was very flammable, even though it passed a test. It does sustain and it does propagate flame. So this investigation did focus on the flammability of materials and the requirement to reassess the criteria that is used to certify materials, not just thermal acoustical insulation blanket material, but also other materials that goes into aircraft, much of it in hidden areas. Investigators now had their answer. A wire arced in a closed space behind the cockpit. The arc ignited the insulation, which in turn lit other materials, such as foams and plastics. The pilots could not sense how quickly the fire intensified. But 14 minutes after they declared pan, 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 the fire disabled all electronics in the cockpit. The black boxes went dead. A forensic examination also shed light on the desperate final minutes in the cockpit. Love was in his seat. Captain Zimmerman was not, likely fighting the fire and probably dead before impact. The uh, first officer was probably trying to find a place where he could put this big airplane. Um, he just didn't have a lot going for him. He didn't have a lot of instrumentation left. And I'm sure he was looking for something, some indication that would give him an idea of where he could put the airplane down, maybe even ditch the airplane. What is known is that the first officer was in his seat, whether he was uh, unconscious, conscious, maybe had severe degree burns on his skin. It's not known. We know the captain was not in his seat, so very likely he was trying to fight the fire. That 
the checklists were found uh, molten together, the pages, indicates that they were used to fight a fire. At 10.30 Halifax time, Love shut down engine two. Investigators determined that he probably received a warning the engine was on fire. Chillingly, it proved that Love was alive a minute before impact. They could not determine whether the passengers were aware of the fire, at least until the very final moments. There were traces found of soot and smoke extending as much far to the business class overhead area. Whether the passengers have smelled the smoke, it's not known. Uh, DNA analysis showed that they had no residue in their body. The aircraft hit the water with a force of 350 Gs. The TSB spent four and a half years and 40 million US dollars analyzing the wreckage of Swiss Air 111, the largest air disaster investigation in Canada's history. Their conclusion? Flammable materials do not belong on commercial aircraft. The rate of progression in this airplane, I think, surprised us and surprised uh, others. Uh, and uh, that's why we emphasize, again, the importance of um, raising the bar on the flammability standards for materials used in airplanes. Ian Shaw waited four years for the report to reveal the fatal flaw that took the life of his daughter. The truth has not diminished his anger at Swiss Air. There has to be accountability. If you are involved in wrongdoing, you must be held accountable. And you must declare your sense of respons responsibility. Otherwise, you are hiding. And you are hiding, in this case, behind the flag of Switzerland. I think it's unbelievable. In the aftermath, Swiss Air decided to remove the flammable insulate from its entire fleet. They also made changes to checklist procedure, reducing response time in a cockpit smoke emergency. Swiss Air did something very interesting. They modified their entire Swiss Air MD-11 fleet. According to all these findings, they built in cameras and smoke detectors, even in, into hidden areas, where pilots have a little TV monitor and they can see whenever there is a smoke warning, which makes them all help gain time. And that's the most important when you have the case of, when you have a fire. But plagued with financial problems, the mighty Swiss Air shocked the industry when it declared bankruptcy in October 2001. The flammable insulation that set Swiss Air ablaze remains in two-thirds of commercial airplanes today, but not for very much longer. The metallized polyethylene terephthalate material has been essentially banned from aircraft, and the criteria to certify that kind of material for use in airplanes has been worked on. It has not been put into law as yet, but uh, we look forward to that being done, so the criteria is more stringent. The US Federal Aviation Administration has given a deadline of 2005 to remove the material from all commercial aircraft. This major overhaul is designed to ensure that what took place on Swiss Air 111 will never happen again. The industry is trying to remove it, but it's, I don't think they're removing it um, as quickly necessary as they could. There's always that battle. How expensive is it to do something that's replacement, or are you going to replace it in an airplane you're going to throw away in another couple of years? We have to live within certain economic realities. For Ian Shaw, losing his daughter so suddenly and violently has left a permanent emotional scar. He left his wife and his wealth behind in Geneva and now runs a modest restaurant in Nova Scotia, in view of the sea where his daughter died. 
why would I come here to this particular point in Nova Scotia? A lot of people have said, oh yes, we fully understand you want to be close to your daughter and, and uh, the point where the plane crashed. That is no part of my being here. Swiss Air um, ripped out of me any possibility of proximity to my daughter. I found a comfort in the awareness of the presence of the eternal ocean, the ocean which has been going backwards and forwards for many, many, many thousands, millions of years. I came here because I had to. Um, I, I can't give a fully rational declaration to you of why I came here. I can only say to you, I am in the right place for the wrong reasons. Crossing the 260 of Lima at 31 miles west, level is 10,700, velocity... October 1996. A state-of-the-art passenger jet careens out of control for 30 horrific minutes, then crashes into the Pacific Ocean. What could have brought down Aero Peru Flight 603? The answer to the mystery may be found in the aircraft's black box flight recorder, a puzzle which investigators must solve. The story they uncover is how a simple human error set off a chain of events that ended in tragedy. Two cents of American money brought down a $75 million aircraft and killed 70 people. This kind of a problem that they faced that night was um, probably one of 10 over the last 20 or 30 years. You never lose hope immediately. You, you know, it takes time for you to get to that point that you, you, you will accept the fact that there's no people that got out of their life. We're gonna turn over! Lima, Peru. Jorge Chavez International Airport. Aero Peru Flight 603 prepared for takeoff to Santiago, Chile. The plane was a four-year-old Boeing 757, a state-of-the-art passenger jet known for its reliability and safety. Aero Peru 603 was flown by two of the national airline's best pilots, Captain Eric Schreiber, 58, and First Officer David Fernandez, 42. Sixty-one passengers and nine crew members were aboard. Most were Chileans on their way home. Others were Peruvian, British, Italian, Spanish, one New Zealander, and other Latin Americans. Among them, the brother-in-law and close friend of Mexico businessman, Monas Albert. We, our companies, do business in uh, South America. We export and every so often we will go to see our clients and, and on this trip uh, 
Kenny and, and, and Abraham went to see some clients in Peru and in Chile. I had a very good relationship with both of them. With my brother-in-law, of course, uh, we were like brothers. I loved the guy. He married my only sister. So it was, we had a great relationship. Checklists complete. First Officer Fernandez hailed the tower. Lima Tower, Aero Peru 603, runway 15, ready for takeoff. Aero Peru 603, use noise abatement. Wind calm, ready for takeoff on runway 15. 1515, transponder. Flaps 15, takeoff briefing complete. The captain makes a joke about their precision. See how accurate we are, not even Swiss. Rolling. The Aero Peru 757 was among a new generation of computer-controlled aircraft in which pilots are trained to rely on a central data system designed to reduce errors, both mechanical and human. Power on takeoff, Power the 757 performed perfectly. 80 knots. Check. V1, rotate. V2. Gear up. All right. Within moments, the pilots received a highly unusual V2 reading. Must have. The altimeters are stuck. The altimeter indicates the height of the aircraft off the ground. It read zero, though they were obviously flying. The altimeters have stuck. Yeah. All of them. This is really new. Keep V2 plus 10. The 757 is equipped with three altimeters. One for pilot, one for co-pilot, one backup. All three were dead. Then they lost another crucial instrument, the airspeed indicator. The speed. Okay. The speed. What's going on? We're not climbing. No, I am climbing, but the speed. Hold it. Maintain speed. Aero Peru 603 left the lights of Lima, out towards the Pacific Ocean. With no airspeed or altitude instruments, the pilots were now flying blind. The air traffic controller in Lima maintained contact with the plane, noting its altitude and course. He did not hear when the pilots got a new minor warning that they must adjust the rudder, which steers the aircraft left and right. 603, we are descending. Rudder ratio. That's strange. Uh, turn to the right. Alan McLeod is a veteran Air Canada pilot. They got a rudder ratio warning, which consists of an amber light that would come flashing on there with a little beeping horn and a message on this engine crew alerting system saying rudder ratio. That's just a system that uh, reduces the amount of rudder the airplane has that can be used as the airplane accelerates and goes faster and faster. Because it was sensing wrong or improper information, it sensed a fault, so it gave a warning to the crew. The erratic warnings were being generated by the plane's central computer, but the pilots could not understand why. Then, the dead altimeters sprang to life. Climb, 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 climb! I am! Climb, you're going down, David. I am up at the speed. Yeah, but it's stuck. A mock trim rudder ratio. Climb, 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 climb! Set heading 100. Now you're... It's okay on this heading. Set the climb thrust. Center autopilot in command. Just as suddenly, the altitude readings return to normal. The moment of calm would be brief. Just one minute after takeoff, Captain Schreiber attempted to engage the autopilot, 
to give them time to think. There is no command. The autopilot requires identical data from two of the aircraft's three flight control computers. But Schreiber's instrument readings were so different from those of Fernandez, the autopilot disengaged. Then another alert. Mach trim, Mach trim. Mach trim indicates that the plane is not flying in a level position. Yet the 757 seemed to be flying normally. Let's go to basic instruments. Everything's going to hell. Mach speed trim is a system that trims the airplane. It changes the angle of the uh, horizontal stabilizer in the back end of the airplane. And uh, that has to be changed as the airplane accelerates to a higher speed. It was getting false indications. So they got a warning that uh, they had an overspeed, which of course they didn't. That warning would consist of, again, the master caution and a master warning, which is a red light associated with a, um, an oral warning as well. Despite confusing warnings and no autopilot, the aircraft was controllable. If necessary, Shriver could have kept the plane aloft for hours. But he decided to land. He instructed Lima his first Aero officer Crew, to declare an emergency. We are in an emergency. Aero Peru 603, Lima. We are declaring an emergency. We have no basic instruments, no altimeter, no airspeed indicator. Declaring emergency. Receive altitude? We don't have. Uh, we're up to uh, 1,000 feet, approximately 1,700. 603. Confirm if possible if you can change your frequency to 119.7 to make sure you can receive radar instructions. Just 40 miles from Lima. The pilots of Aero Peru 603 now made their first attempt at an emergency landing. Puzzled by their problems, they began to suspect that the Aero Peru ground crew had tampered with the aircraft. Change to 119.7. Auto throttle disconnected by itself. Is that it's in maintenance? Move everything. What have they done? I'll take the controls now. Okay, you have control. The pilots did not know that their suspicions were close to the truth. But there was no time to speculate further. Lima, 603. Aero Peru, 603, Lima. We request vectors for ILS. Runway 15. They sought the runway with the help of a guidance transmitter called the Instrument Landing System, or ILS. The ILS provides information on their course, while altitude information comes from the aircraft's transponder. Affirmative. Maintain present altitude. What level do we have? We have 4,000 feet. Can you confirm for us? Correct. Maintain 4,000. Schreiber and Fernandez had never we experienced nor been trained for this emergency. Auto throttle disconnect. Really, we don't have any control. We don't have any control, not even the basics. Let's see. Check everything. The airplane was controllable, but you first have to diagnose what's wrong. And it's very easy from 20-20 hindsight sitting here in a chair on a nice sunny day to say, this is what he should have done. But in the cold, dark night with bells and whistles going off, uh, it's very difficult to analyze conflicting information that you're getting. This kind of a problem that they faced that night was um, probably one of over the last 20 or 30 years that has been similar to this. Over the dark Pacific Ocean, the pilots could not determine altitude nor speed by sight. They requested that the tower help guide them in. Responding. Airspeed is zero. All speeds. Right. Can you give us the airspeed, please, if you have us on the radar? 
Yes, affirmative. As of 10 seconds... It seems that you're climbing at level 6,000 at 22 miles south on heading 195. The air traffic controller's computers calculated a correct airspeed by measuring the plane's movement over the ground. Okay, we have that. We are on heading 190 and we have 7,000 feet on the altimeter. Yes, correct. You're now reaching 7,000. But neither the pilots nor the air traffic controller knew that the altitude indicated on the scope was incorrect. It was coming from the plane's erratic computer. The traffic controller would try to help the pilot, but he was receiving the wrong information on altitude. He was receiving a wrong indication from the captain's altimeter. The reason the uh, air traffic control system was transmitting improper altitude readout information to the airplane was because the airplane's altimeter through the air data computer would send the indicated altitude that the airplane was experiencing down to the radar unit and of course it was incorrect and they would read it off their readout down in the uh, air traffic control center and transmit it back to the pilots and of course it was incorrect because they were getting incorrect information to begin with. Investigators would later discover that Aero Peru 603 was drifting downward, while the altimeters showed them at a near constant 10,000 feet. The passengers were as yet unaware of the drama unfolding in the cockpit. Avoid large or abrupt radar inputs. If normal left hydraulic system pressure available... Left now Captain Schreiber ordered Fernandez available. to scan the flight yes, manual for some explanation of the warnings. Left hydraulic system available. Yes, crosswind, do not attempt an auto land. In Lima, the air traffic controller continued to guide Aero Peru 603 back to the ground. Aero Peru 603, we are observing you now at level 9,200. What is your heading now? We're heading level 205. Affirmative. And we're turning slowly to the right, correct? No, we are maintaining course to stay away from the coast. With incorrect altitude information being transmitted from the aircraft to the tower, they did not realize that the plane was descending. Your distance is 30 miles. Do you want a heading to proceed to the localizer, correct? Correct. We are going to suggest course north 360. 360. We have problems here reading the instruments. You're going to have to help me with altitudes and airspeeds if it is possible. Okay, proceed. Let's go. The approach is set. The 757's computer sent critical warnings, information that the pilots were trained to obey but could not trust. Let's try to make a descent on this heading. It's climbing. The airspeed plummeted to below stall speed and then raced up again. Let's go down at 10,000 feet. Why does the speed go away so fast? Could it be the real speed? That's what worries me. No, I don't think so. Can you verify our speed, please? 320 is indicated. We have 350, but the no. engines are on idle, but we keep accelerating and accelerating. OK, received. Nerves were now stretched tight. You can imagine the pilots, they're flying there. They don't have a true indication of the speed. They're obviously trying to fly the airplane and changing the attitude up and down. That in itself will change an indication of airspeed, although it was incorrect. Both pilots were really confused. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to act. And they did uh, unhuman uh, efforts to save the aircraft. But uh, I mean, they, they were really tired and uh, of all the work and all the confusion and all the alarms. Fernandez suggested that they try the speed brakes, used to rapidly slow the aircraft. Extend the speed brakes. For a moment, it appeared to be working. Then, another warning. All three indicators are fine on speed, fine on speed. Over speed. Over speed means the plane is flying too fast. The pilots didn't believe it. But if it was right, the 757 could be torn apart. They were forced to make a decision, to speed up 
or slow down. If they got it wrong, 70 people would die. Fifteen minutes had passed since takeoff. Then the computerized brain of Aero Peru 603 sent another burst of contradictory warnings. Butter ratio. Can't be. Nothing's disconnecting. All engine instruments are OK. What can our real speed be? The speed indication. Lima Tower provided their only chance of survival. We are observing you crossing the 260 of Lima at 31 miles west. Level is 10,700. Velocity is approximately 280 over the ground. Perfect. The controller's altitude reading was incorrect. Junk information being generated by the 757's computers and radioed to the tower. Overspeed. The brakes were on, but now Watch another speed overspeed brakes. warning. Then the stall warning sounded. Let's descend. Can't be over speed. We're still flying. They get a stall warning that the airplane is uh, falling out of the sky. At the same time, they got over speed warning. Uh, impossible to have two contradictory uh, alarms. Either you're stalling or either you're uh, having an over speed. So that created more confusion. Really, uh, this uh, problem has never happened before. It was a new emergency. In aviation, you always figure, what's going to kill me? <laughs> what is the critical thing? Let's take care of that first. And then um, we'll take care of the other lesser issues uh, later on. Uh, when you get a stall warning or when you get an overspeed indication, you need to pay attention to those immediately. In this case, they were getting both a stall warning and an overspeed. Well, which is right? First Officer David Fernandez finally realized that the odds were against a safe landing. We request, is there any plane that can take off and rescue us? Acknowledged, rescue has been alerted. Any plane in the area to guide us? An Aero Peru that may be in the area. Anybody? Oh, don't say anything like that. Yes, because right now we are in a stall. The stick shaker vibrated violently, indicating that the 757 was going too slow and could fall from the sky. Aero Peru 603, we have a 707 that is leaving for Budawell. We will advise him. We are not in a stall. It's a false alarm. Schreiber's airspeed indicator read 350 knots, well above stall speed. No, we have stick shaker. It has to be. But even with speed brakes and everything, we're maintaining 9,500 feet. Why aren't we getting the same reading? When the airplane is slowed up to a, to a point in the air that it can no longer sustain itself in flight, um, it stalls. The wing stalls or stops flying. There's a warning system built into the airplane that tells the pilots when that's happening. It's known as a stick shaker, along with a voice warning, which we just heard. Uh, when the stick shaker goes off because the airplane has slowed down too much, you get a warning like this, where the control column is shaking and vibrating along with the voice warning saying that the airplane is stalling. And of course, the pilots would go into the aircraft stall recovery procedure at that point. In the battle between man and machine, the deranged 757 was winning. The pilots now had no sense of where they were or how high. They had gradually been descending and were now just 1,000 feet over the sea. Lima Tower, misguided by Aero Peru 603's incorrect transponder, reassured the pilots that they were at 10,000 feet. Aero Peru 603, you are now flying on course 120. We observe you to be at level 10,000. Your speed is approximately 220 and a distance from Lima of 33 miles to the northwest. The 707 will be ready in 15 minutes to fly west to help you. The pilots had to abandon their attempt at landing. The best hope now was that another aircraft could get airborne and guide the 757 back to the airport. To have another aircraft come alongside and formate, or you formate on it, would have, one, would have been one way of, of uh, recovering from this abnormal situation. However, we, we uh, must remember that the flight was at night in darkness. The pilots may or may not have had any formation flying training. That would have been one way to resolve the problem quite, quite well, actually. 
What's happening? Too low to Now the pilots receive the most terrifying warning of all. It is called the ground proximity alarm, meaning a collision with the earth is imminent. Still, the tower told them they were at 10,000 feet. Course of 300. We have the terrain alarm and we're supposed to be at 10,000 feet. According to the monitor, you have 105. Too low terrain. Too low terrain. There is no checklist for if you have these seven or eight warnings going off, which they did, and they couldn't shut them off. Uh, it's, it's, a very, it's a very rattling experience. I could play that tape for you and you hear those things, whoop, whoop, pull up, terrain, terrain, and, and all of these things going off and the stick shaker, brrrr. It, uh, it's a very unnerving uh, environment. All the computers are going crazy here. Schreiber turned the aircraft toward the sea, away from a possible collision with a mountain or skyscraper. Despite the erroneous warnings, the terrain alarm was correct. There's a system on board the aircraft called the ground proximity warning system. And uh, it senses a rate of descent in the airplane. The irony of the situation was they were getting warnings from that saying, too low, terrain, terrain, too low. That probably, in all probability, was a true warning. But because they'd been subjected to so many warnings and ongoing false warnings, horns, bells, and whistles, that they didn't really, I don't think, react to that uh, too, too seriously. The air traffic controller noted Aero Peru's new course away from Lima. Aero Peru, 603. I don't understand you. We observe you turning to the left, circling to the west. Affirmative, we are heading 250, but we are going out towards sea because of the low terrain alarm. The tower confirmed that the 757 had turned away from the airport, out toward the open Pacific. Yes, affirmative. We observe you 42 miles, flying to the west, course 250. We are over water, aren't we? Affirmative. Over the water, you are 42 miles to the west. Now in darkness and heavy haze, the pilots had another problem with their speed. Are we going down now? We have 370 knots. Are we descending now? We are showing the same speed. You have 200 knots speed approximately. Speed 200 knots? 220 ground speed, reducing speed slightly. The pilots were stunned. 200 knots was precariously close to a stall speed. Damn, we're gonna stall right now. Let's go up, let's see, let's go up here. The two men struggled with the deadly situation. A computer that warns them of flying too fast, too slow, and too low all at once. Schreiber now decided to risk a second attempt at landing, seeking the signal known as the ILS to guide the aircraft to the runway. I want to try to intercept the ILS. I'm trying to descend. Lima, Aero Peru 603. We will try to intercept the ILS. Let us know if we are in. Received, Aero Peru 603. You show now level 9700. The instrument seemed to be working. For a moment, there was a glimmer of hope. This one's right. This one's OK, too. The air traffic controller attempted to raise the pilot's spirits with good news. Stand by to verify speed. The 707 is about to take off. It is on taxi. Confirm our speed. It is very important we do not have any speed indications on board. Understood. You're starting to turn, and we observe your ground speed at 270. Stay there, Eric. 270 is OK. They now knew their speed, but altitude remained fatally wrong. Altitude is 9,700, your speed is 240 knots, ground speed on the monitor. How can we be flying at this speed if we're descending with engines on idle? Give me the altitude, please. Yes, you are maintaining 9,700 according to the scope, sir. 9,700? Yes, correct. What is your indicated altitude? Do you have any visual reference? 9,700, but it is indicating too low terrain. Are you sure you have us on the radar at 50 miles? Hey, look, with 370, we have 370 what? Do we lower gear? 
Aero Peru 603 Lima. What do we do with the gear? Suddenly, they realize the awful truth. We're hitting water! Pull it up! Climb. Climb Aero Peru 603. If you need to, pull up. For 20 seconds, the pilots struggle for altitude. I've got it! I've got it! We're gonna turn it over! Aero Peru 603, Lima. Aero Peru 603, Lima. The next morning, Mexico businessman Monas Albert learned that an Aero Peru flight had crashed. Five minutes after takeoff, the crew informed the tower that they were having an emergency and they requested clearance to return to Lima. During the process, contact with the aircraft was lost at 0110, with the latest position of the aircraft being 50 miles north of the city of Lima. About six o'clock in the morning, I got up and turned on the news channel, and I heard there was a, a crash, an airplane crash of Aero Peru, but the news mentioned New York to, to Lima. Rescue operations are underway by authorities. The aircraft was carrying 61 passengers and nine crew members. His brother-in-law and his business partner were on Aero Peru 603. So I went to the shower and didn't pay a lot of attention. But when I came out, they corrected uh, the news and they said from Lima to Santiago. And I knew in that plane, Kenny and Abraham were flying. The news was very vague, so they mentioned there might be some survivors, and they mentioned that the, the plane crashed on the Pacific Ocean, and, and they didn't have a lot of uh, news, and the crash was at night. So in my mind, I thought that the plane sort of landed on water, and, and most people got out. Guido Fernandez had just been appointed Peru's accident investigator. Aero Peru was his first case. The co-pilot, David Fernandez, was his nephew. I was in bed. It was uh, about 4.30 in the morning, and they called me. Your nephew uh, is lost in an airplane. They asked me, I mean, how do you feel that your nephew was a co-pilot? My gosh, I, I feel very bad. But I'm a professional, I have to do a job. I have to comply uh, and complete my, my duty. So uh, that's what I did. Fernandez rushed to the crash site in a Navy helicopter. It was clear there were no survivors. Nine bodies were floating in the debris. The rest sank with the 757. Fernandez met with the air traffic controller at Lima Tower. His account was baffling. Well, the controller uh, really didn't know. He was just uh, trying to help. So uh, he did all he could to help him. But uh, unfortunately for him, it was a new emergency too. Fernandez put thoughts of his nephew out of his mind. His job was to retrieve the aircraft's flight data and voice recorders to determine what happened. He needed help. Fernandez contacted the National Transportation Safety Board in Washington, D.C., the world's leading agency for air accident investigation. They had found the aircraft. It was. Uh, pretty well documented by radar. Uh, the Navy, the Peruvian Navy, had uh, uh, gotten a uh, fix on the flotsam and the wreckage in the ocean. And uh, the only uh, thing left to do was find it on the bottom of the ocean, which they did not have the facilities for. 
Rodriguez flew to Lima to join Guido Fernandez's effort to find answers. When I found out that his nephew was the first officer. I suggested that perhaps they should consider removing uh, Captain Fernandez from the investigation because of emotional involvement and what have you. The American investigators' concerns soon vanished. He was uh, very objective, I would say, an excellent investigator, considering that it was, and not a distant nephew, I mean, it was his very close relative. Uh, he, um, he did a, an outstanding job. The black box in the Boeing 757 can emit a locator beacon for 30 days before batteries run dead. The US Navy provided underwater remote operated vehicles to survey the debris field, seeking the black boxes. The wreckage confirmed that the plane went down in one piece. I've done in-flight breakups that were spread over 15, 16 miles and maybe a mile and a half wide, which tells you instantly that the, I mean, just what you know of the looking at the wreckage, that this thing didn't hit in one piece. It clearly was disintegrating as it was uh, crashing. But in this case, it was a fairly tight debris field, and uh, so obviously it hit at high speed and uh, was fairly closely knit uh, wreckage pattern. The data recorders were retrieved from the 757. Brought to the surface, the boxes were placed in coolers full of fresh water to keep them from oxidizing. They were taken back to Washington for analysis at the NTSB. The cockpit recorder could offer the evidence investigators sought. Every word spoken by pilot Schreiber and Fernandez and every unnerving alarm was recorded on audio tape. The recorded voices were faint, sometimes hard to make out, but the chaos in the cockpit rang through with chilling clarity. The tape was digitized into a computer, filtered, and enhanced. Now investigators had the clue they'd been looking for. It was clear to us that uh, there were, they were really experiencing a problem with airspeed and altitude, and um, the airspeed and altitude indications in the aircraft are strictly a function of the, what we call the pitot-static system. The pitot-static system is found on all aircraft, large or small. External ports measure outside air pressure to provide data on altitude and speed. If these ports are blocked, the plane's computers receive false data and generate false warnings. But why these ports would be blocked was a mystery. Robotic vehicles searched for the missing piece of the puzzle. What they found stunned investigators. Captain Schreiber's static port was completely blocked with the tape. Investigators now learned what happened. Just before Aero Peru 603 lifted off from Lima, maintenance workers cleaned the aircraft. A worker covered the static ports with tape to protect them. This is standard procedure, but he forgot to remove the tape. It was a small oversight with catastrophic results. The taping was never removed, and when the airplane uh, departed and, and started to fly, nothing but trapped static uh, sea level air pressure was sensed by those instruments. And in a matter of fact, the airplane was climbing up in thinner air, and the um, uh, the information presented on the instruments and to the air data computer was false, which generated uh, just totally non-normal readings. The inspector who was supposed to quality check his work did not do it. 
and the supervisor out on the line that night was not there, he was sick, and there was a, uh, a regular mechanic who was filling that role, he did not see it. And the captain or the pilot, in this case the captain did the pre-flight, um, they do a walk around looking for just that kind of thing. Um, the captain did the pre-flight that night and he did not detect it either. A little piece of paper with glue caused an accident. But the paper and the glue are not to blame. Humans are to blame because humans use that tape in the wrong place for the wrong purpose. Another accident, shockingly similar to Aero Peru 603, had happened just eight months earlier to another 757. In February 1996, 189 people died when a German charter called Bergen Air crashed five miles after takeoff from Puerto Plata, Dominican Republic. The NTSB assisted in the investigation. A survey of the wreckage revealed that one pitot tube, the other critical part of the pitot-static system, was blocked. As with Aero Peru 603, night was the pilot's worst enemy. The Bergen Air pilot flipped the plane upside down before crashing into the sea. The Bergen accident clearly pointed out already that a crew will get confused by these cryptic advisories, rudder ratio, mark airspeed trim, and not getting a clear indication uh, what the underlying problem is, which is a problem with the air data computer or anything which comes behind it, the pitot tube or the static port. These were facts which were well known to the manufacturer, and so it happened again. Three months after the Bergen air crash, bulletins were issued to all airline carriers about the pitot static problems. But Aero Peru had not yet implemented the changes. The bulletins and the, let's call it the fruits of the Dominican Republic investigation of Bergen Air had not yet reached Aero Peru at the time this accident occurred. The Peruvian government very correctly made a point of that in their report on the accident, saying that they should have given more impetus to those recommendations to get them out to the industry quicker. Well, it's very unfortunate, but it, 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 it comes back to the fact that communication in aviation um, is sometimes deficient. There is not that high level of exchange of information between different operators, as they are all competitors. They do not exchange certain information, and specifically not the one which is safety related. And that's definitely the case in the, in the Air Peru accident. 9700, but it is indicating too low terrain. Even if Schreiber and Fernandez had known about Bergen Air, it may not have helped them survive, given the high pressure of their situation. It's easy to sit here in the 757 cockpit and play the Monday morning quarterback. Uh, having heard the bells and the overspeed warnings, the ground proximity warning, the stall warning, um, it was very easy to do that and sit here and, and say what I would have done being an experienced pilot. But to put yourself into the position of those two pilots that night, they were in an extremely difficult situation to fly that airplane and, and recover from that, uh, that experience. Two weeks after the crash, Monas Albert joined dozens of grieving families, seeking the remains of his brother-in-law and friend. He finally identified them in a Lima morgue. I wanted to find them. I really wanted to find them. And, and one part of me didn't want to find them because the, there was this fantasy that if I don't find them, maybe they're in an island with a, with a, with a drink and looking at some girls dancing. I can close the chapter, I can, I can go and take him and have him buried and, and there'll be a place for the family to go and, and 
put some flowers once in a while and and say, okay, my, my brother-in-law is here, or my dad is here, or my husband is here. Now that investigators had the answer to the mysterious loss of Aero Peru 603, the lawsuits began. In November 1996, a Miami lawyer took on the case on behalf of 41 passengers and crew arguing that the manufacturer, Boeing, was liable for the accident. Boeing has to foresee the misuse of their product. In other words, the manufacturer of a product is legally liable for the foreseeable misuse of their product, if it can be corrected. In other words, Boeing builds the airplane with, a, with potential hazard in it. That hazard is that in order to clean the airplane, you have to cover the static port. And if you don't take it off, the airplane can crash. I wanted them back. And since I couldn't get them back, at least I wanted the wives of the victims to get compensated. How much is that worth? I don't know. I didn't know. Abraham had three daughters, and now they don't have a father. So what is the compensation? The best compensation, if, if can be done, is get them back give them life back again. But because that is not possible, then the other possibility is to get a monetary compensation. And then you fight for the best compensation you can get. Boeing argued that Aero Peru was at fault, not its 757. An Aero Peru worker taped the static port, which is marked with clear warnings. Boeing also blamed Captain Eric Schreiber. It was his job to visually inspect the aircraft before taking off. But investigator Richard Rodriguez can understand how Schreiber overlooked the tape on the static port. One of the reasons is it's very high. It's about maybe 15, 17 feet up in the air. And at night with the flashlight, and this happened to be duct tape, which you're not supposed to use. They're, they specify the tape and it was duct tape, which is silver so it would not distinguish itself against the background of the fuselage of the aircraft. So basically three or four people failed to detect the tape on the aircraft prior to departure. As the search for blame continued, the worker who taped the ports was jailed for his negligence. Uh, lawyers, the lawyers, uh, you know, sometimes they confuse the matters and uh, they send the guy and uh, ask people questions and ask questions and the one that stuck the tape was the painter. It was the, the, the lowest cultured and the, the one that knew less about what could happen. And the judge uh, resolved that uh, he was the, the one uh, responsible and he was in jail. So that you don't lose the airplane because a maintenance man making $2 an hour down in Peru makes a mistake. It's foreseeable that that kind of a person is going to make a mistake. That's human nature they're going to make a mistake. And you build your system so you don't lose your $50 million airplane because a maintenance guy makes a simple mistake. Schreiber and Fernandez were also scrutinized. Veteran pilot Alan McLeod believes that in their situation, he would not have attempted to land he would have continued to fly for as long as he could, with the plane angled upward slightly and the speed set just above cruise. Experience has shown that if, if you don't fly the airplane when you're experiencing an abnormal situation, and they certainly were, uh, you must fly the airplane. Just concentrate on flying the airplane and get the airplane under control, first and foremost. Are we going down now? We have 370 knots. If you don't do that, the airplane's gonna bite you you're going to end up uh, in more serious situations. So I would fly the airplane, make sure I was able to fly it safely, if only by using the attitude direction indicator and normal power settings that I was familiar with, and then eventually work my way back and get it on the ground. Pilots call it flying by numbers, relying not on computers, but on basic aviation and human instinct. It always becomes a problem when pilots are reduced to be push-buttonists. 
the man-machine interface has to work and has to work as humans are to operate these airplanes. They have to be, to be designed appropriately for the use of a human being. Of course, you can put in all digits and numbers and, 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 and computer gimmicks, uh, and you can, but still it's man who has to operate and survey it. And I believe uh, a human being should be in charge. In 1999, Boeing and Aero Peru decided to settle the lawsuits out of court. Families and loved ones received an exceptional settlement, averaging a million dollars US per victim. The damages were high because of the terrible way the passengers and crew on Aero Peru died. We were able to show that a lot of the people were alive. In a crash like this, a lot of the people would survive the crash and then died of drowning. There was no question in our minds that the people suffered terrible, terrible terror and pain when this happened to them. They were horrified. They were awake. They knew what happened. The disaster helped sink Aero Peru. Combined with increased competition and rising debt, the national airline went bankrupt in 1999. Boeing increased training on pitostatic problems and issued new regulations about unapproved static port covers. Since 1996, there has not been another pitostatic failure like the one on Aero Peru 603. The designers of these products, the manufacturers of the products, I know that they have to take safety into account. They have to, of course, they do that because they know it's the right thing to do. But they also know that if they don't do it, there's going to be somebody watching them that's going to investigate it, that's going to find out why it happened, and that they're going to be accountable for what they do wrong. And that if they don't take into consideration safety, they're going to have to pay for it. Well, it, uh, the accidents made the aviation industry aware that something simple like a pitot tube or a static port can cause a major incident or even an accident. And even airline pilots were reminded that uh, this is a vital basic thing and it may happen and this is the way how to prevent it to turn into a catastrophe. The case was settled the industry repented and moved on. Such is the world of commercial aviation. But it was little consolation for those whose lives were scarred forever by an insignificant piece of tape. It suddenly, you say that the guy doesn't exist anymore. It's very hard to swallow that. It's very hard to, to understand. And it took me uh, a long time to accept so the memory is still there, and it will be there for a long time. I'm not going to let go. I don't want to let go.